corruption. Corruption is inevitable. Number one target. They need protection. The landlords need it. And they're willing to pay it. You can see what happens if they don't pay it. People are not willing to talk about it. People aren't willing to give evidence. What are you doing with ruthless people? These people are prepared to kill to protect their illegal business sources. These people need putting in the same box as my brother was put in. Well, I'm Mick Baxendale and I'm the manager licensee of the Niche Nightclub. Four hours after giving this interview, Mick Baxendale was dead. Protection racketeering extorting money from people through intimidation is one of the most widespread and corrosive forms of organized crime it's extremely difficult to stamp out its victims are too terrified to talk in this program how the racketeers got one city manchester in their grip and who's behind the thuggery Manchester's nightlife is legendary, but gangland violence threatens its future. Now, the Canal Street gay village is the centre of activity, but it's buzzing here because the great all-night rave clubs, like the Hacienda, have been killed by gangs. There are thousands and thousands of people going out in Manchester every weekend on Canal Street. On the surface, it looks as though Manchester has never been busier, never been more popular, never been more successful. However, you have to acknowledge the difference between um, discotheques and nightclubs and bars. What made Manchester famous was the Hacienda nightclub. What came out of that was an entire music scene, which we now call the Manchester music scene, which made Man put Manchester on the international map. Clubland has always attracted gangsters. There's money to be made. Money from extortion and money from drugs. Big money. Supplying those drugs to the ravers that arrived in Manchester in 1988 and 89 from all over the country made a lot of gangsters um, millionaires. It's as simple as that. If you're supplying a nightclub, the easiest way to protect your territory is to make sure that the bouncers on the door are friendly to your interests. City centre bouncers are now regulated and registered. But in the 1980s, gangs fought and won a war to control the doors. Now, the victors of that war have extended their power across Manchester and other northern cities. There were three main groupings. Cheatham Hill, known locally as The Hill. Two main formings in uh, Moss Side called The Gooch and Doddington. Uh, named after two streets in Moss Side, one on the west side, one on the east side. And then the Salford, which is split mainly along family lines, though they'll group together when and if it's necessary. As Manchester's clubs soared to national and international fame, these gangs buzzed around their new honeypot. The bigger the name, the bigger the target. Hacienda created the phenomenon of Manchester, a thriving music and club scene. But the Hacienda lost control of its door to possibly the most powerful gang in Manchester, the Salford. From then on, it was doomed. The Hacienda is closing its doors as of today. This place is coming like a ghost town. But the closure of Manchester's clubs didn't mean the end of the Salford gang, just new targets for their bully boys. They turned their muscle on the city's pubs. 
The Salford Gang consists of loose-knit groups of thugs who operate their own territories in the city. They pay their dues to the Salford leadership and use this gang affiliation to impose their so-called security services on landlords. I met two doormen who, for obvious reasons, agreed to speak to me only under the guarantee of anonymity. They explained how the system works. We work for these people. Then people know who they are, or they've heard of them, and it frightens them away. Because they're big boys, you know what I mean, the big time. We're just the middlemen for them. We get 30 quid a night, yeah? Landlord pays 60. I collect the money, take it down to him, pay the lads out, give him what he, what he gets. He gets over 30 pound off each man, you see. He's got like 200 lads working for him. More than 300 Manchester pubs have been closed or burnt out in recent years. How many through extortion? There are no statistics, and neither breweries nor landlords are willing to discuss the issue of the racketeers. The landlord's going to save more money paying us than he is going to have to refurbish his business because it's been wrecked. So they're going to pay you that. We don't like people trying to muscle in on our door. We don't have any of that. We get people coming to the pubs that we run because um, they want to take over. They want the money, don't they? They want it for their business. Uh, but we're not allowing it. It's our business, isn't it? We want the money. They turn against us. Kick okay. no, ass, don't we? <laughs> as simple as that. These pubs that have shut down, there's quite a few. And that's just because they're not willing to pay for doorman or for protection money. So people's just gone in, trashed the pub, petrol bombed it, and it's just cost them so much money to get it right. And all they needed to get a few doormen pay something up to 50 quid. Problem solved. They've put them out of business, they've lost a lot of money. It's not just publicans. Any shopkeeper can find himself in need of security from people with gang connections. Neighbourhood corner grocery stores, often owned by Asian families, are particularly vulnerable. Packages of targets. There's a Pakistani shop near us, a supermarket. They had a bit of trouble a couple of weeks ago. We went down and saw it out. They got on the wrong, wrong side end of it. They thought they could take it themselves, but obviously not and the shop got blew out. Well, that's what you're looking at if they don't pay. They've got to live over that shop. He's already moved once through, like, people want protection off him. So he's got kids upstairs and all that lot. He doesn't want to fire bomb, simple as that. No, he's happy. He's happy little packy. <laughs> and that's what he is. Now he's paying me, say, £30 a week, £40 a week. I've got easy money again. But that's, for me, that's my own money. I don't have to part with that with the big one. In Salford, the big one, the man alleged to be behind the city's protection rackets, is widely known, though few will name him publicly. It took four days of rioting in Ordsall, in which shots were fired at police to flush him out. Local councillor, the late Joe Burrows, told newspapers that a man named Paul Massey was the Mr Big behind Salford's gangsters. Massey went on television to deny the charge, accusing the police themselves of provoking the riots. Plenty of people who've had their doors kicked in and dragged out and had their houses searched and never been in trouble with the police. Have you protested to the police? We've protested, we've put complaints in all over, everyone else has put complaints in all over. It's all whitewashed by the police. Although suspected of heavy involvement in organised crime, Massey always strenuously denied this. Indeed, he had only been convicted for fraud. But while Massey portrays himself as a spokesman for the community, policemen who've investigated him paint a different picture. He frequently pops up, portraying himself as some sort of Robin Hood. And this, is, this isn't the case. This isn't the case. It's far more sinister. He's certainly been behind a great number of um, incidents. 
is becoming difficult to prosecute because he's able now, having established many enterprises in the city, to stand back from obvious hands-on involvement and therefore it will be very difficult to link to um, particular events. With family connections to PMS, one of Salford's most prominent security companies, Massey is a well-established local figure. But such is the aura of fear that surrounds him and his henchmen that few people, if any in Salford, will give evidence against him. I think the consequences of trying to give evidence against um, Paul Massey could have very severe repercussions for anybody that was minded to do so. Five years ago, Massey was accused of organising a night of violence at Manchester's plush Piccadilly 21 Club. Two innocent bystanders were stabbed. Massey and eight others were arrested. A dozen witnesses told the police what had happened. But when the case came to trial, not one of them was willing to take the stand. Massey and his associates walked free from court and posed for the photographers getting evidence, getting somebody to stand up in court and say that man did this is very, very difficult. And the circumstances today of uh, the way people are prosecuted make it now impossible. It's very sad, but that's the truth. Then behave yourselves, or else otherwise you will see Brexit stop completely. These scenes erupted when fans of Salford boxer Steve Foster battled with supporters of his opponent outside the ring at Birmingham's NEC. Paul Massey was among those arrested in the aftermath of the fighting. Eleven men admitted their part in the violence and were sentenced. But Massey was acquitted. Massey's arrogance appears to know no bounds. He was even accused of threatening to kill policemen who stopped him for drink driving. Finally, on a July night, outside the Beaten Track pub in Manchester, Massey's taste for violence caught up with him. In a confrontation with stagnite revellers, he stabbed a man in the groin and left him for dead. But this time, Massey had blundered. His attack had been witnessed by a policeman. While Confederates obstructed the police, Massey took his chance and fled. In part two, while their leader was on the run, how the Salford gang took extortion onto the streets. In Salford, the culture of intimidation is so rife, protection flourishes right at the grassroots. Take Salford Market, ordinary people trying to make an ordinary living. Yet even while their leader, Paul Massey, is on the run, the Salford gang take their cut, regularly demanding one pound from each storeholder in return for security. Our researcher witnessed the enforcer at work and spoke to stallholders about the bogus security operation. I was getting annoyed, but if you stopped paying him, he'd probably have you done. He's one of them villains. It was a waste of time because he was never around. He'd pay him the pound. I felt as though I was getting ripped off. He looks scary, that bloke, actually. I won't get to argue with him. Well, it's not that. It's who he works for. Later, our researcher called the markets officer at Salford Council. He, he didn't seem to have any ID or uniform or anything like that. Oh, no, he doesn't, no. He doesn't. To be honest, he's just one of the local lads. Yeah. And all the villains know him, so they keep away from him. Do you rec what do you recommend that you, that you pay? Or... It's up to yourself. I'm, I'm just amazed that, that you, you tolerate it, really, if you know what's going on. Well, as I say, it was instigated by the trainers, eh? But you're responsible for the market, surely? Well, yeah, for the running of it, but no. We don't have any security, you see, that's the problem. So he's not contracted to the council or anything like that? No, no. It might seem small beer, a pound a day, and some traders welcome the guarantee of security, but it's still extortion, profiting out of fear, and the Salford gang are quite capable of carrying that fear right into people's homes. 
quite a number of my constituents came to me to express their concern that um, scrawled leaflets had been put through their doors asking them to pay a pound a week um, for security uh, to be protected. For the vulnerable in the community, the elderly or single parent families, a knock on the door from the thugs who operate these rackets presents a frightening dilemma. Pay up and accept the offer of protection or turn them away empty-handed. Constituents who came to me um, were particularly worried what the consequences would be if they didn't pay. With the evidence of vandalism and property crime all around, it takes a steady nerve to stand up to the bullies. Many of the racketeers operate under the cover of apparently legitimate security companies. It seems strange that in Britain you can leave Strangeways Jail in Manchester on a Friday, register yourself on the Monday as a company director, get yourself a pinstripe suit, a mobile, a gun and a baseball bat and run yourself a security company. That isn't right and that should end. For years, local MP Ian McCartney has campaigned on behalf of his constituents against these bogus companies. I'm talking about people who've had their jaws fractured, their face compounded, uh, their legs uh, smashed, a uh, screwdriver in one case shoved into someone's eye. You're dealing with ruthless people. These people are prepared to kill to protect their illegal business sources. In one instance, uh, a club owner was burnt to death. As a leading campaigner, Ian McCartney himself has become a target of the racketeers. We've had uh, a wreath nailed to our door. My wife has had uh, mass cards uh, uh, commiserating on my death. We've had the car tamper with outside during the night. I get duffed off in a club. My wife dropped me off for five minutes and was going to come back for me. Uh, and uh, I was attacked and uh, had my nose broken. While Paul Massey was on the run in Europe, Salford's gangsters sought new targets further afield. An hour's drive across the Pennines, they descended on Sheffield and the Niche, then the city's only 24-hour nightclub. They've come in specifically to cause problems because you don't carry knives unless you're prepared to use them. These people need putting in the same box as my brother was put in. Well, I'm Mick Baxendale and I'm the manager licensee of the Niche Nightclub. Mick Baxendale was talking in the early hours of the morning he was killed. They spilled out onto the street. My brother was with the doorman. They then went on to pull knives out and jump up and down chanting that they were the Salford gang. And then a fight developed. One of my doormen had two stabbing him, which they did four times um, by two knives. And my brother got fatally stabbed in a confrontation with the rest of them. He got stabbed twice. My friends who work in Manchester nightclubs you know every one of these gang, this gang by name. They've been barred from the whole of the Manchester area. They've destroyed all the good clubs in the wake by the drug dealing or causing extreme levels of violence. Almost a year later, and no one has been charged with Mick Baxendale's murder. But back here in central Manchester, there's evidence of a new will to take on the gangsters. Can you have your three pounds ready, please? Can you have your money ready, we'll get you in faster. The word gangster adds a kind of a, a kudos to basically unsavories. We call them mitt mops, and we don't give them that kudos of calling them gangsters. I think what we need to do is break that image of them. The clubs, the police and the council want to paint a rosy picture of Manchester nightlife. There's a new public CCTV system on the way. There's registration in place for all doormen. Police and clubs now work together to apply a firm hand against gangland. But a new wave of wannabe gangsters is emerging. Young, arrogant and dangerously well-armed. Kids running around and when they've been stopped from going to a club, or they've been drunk or thrown out of the club, 
All they do, the first thing you hear in Manchester, I'm going to shoot you. I've had a geezer, right, who had an argument with, it was nothing to do with me this night, but he was quite willing to go and shoot a doorman for a pound. I had to keep saying to this kid, I mean, I know him, and I says, why do you want to go home, right, and arm yourself to come back and shoot him over a pound? He's letting you in for a pound. I'll even pay the pound. I put my hand in my pocket and he went like that. It's not the pound, it's the principle. When young men get it into their heads that it's cool to carry a gun, then life becomes cheap. And in the power vacuum created when Paul Massey took to his heels, that's a very dangerous situation. After the stabbing outside Manchester's beaten track pub, Massey laid low in Amsterdam. But the Dutch authorities caught up with him outside a club on the fringe of the red light district and handed him over to Manchester police. With the testimony of a police witness against him, Massey was convicted and sentenced to 14 years in prison. But the jailing of Massey has unleashed a new tide of violence. First, it was the turn of a man named Stephen Lydiot. As he drank in the ship in Salford, a hooded gunman walked in and fired 14 bullets into him. We heard two uh, gunshots, closely followed by another two. Two days later, five innocent bystanders were shot down in cold blood as gunmen attempted to escape police pursuers. Then a bizarre series of kidnappings and shootings testified to the gangland anarchy that's followed Massey's conviction. At least as far as Paul Massey is concerned, the Manchester police have shown that the Godfathers are not untouchable. But how many others are waiting to step into Mr. Massey's shoes? One thing's for sure, so long as young men armed with guns or baseball bats can see the chance to make easy money through other people's fear, the protection business will be with us. This business is going to get bigger. Like, the kids of today, they're going to be growing up as it's, like, getting violent, and they're going to be coming into what we do. You think it's an expanding business, a growing business, you can build it up? Yeah, of course you've got loads of money to be in. you got a business plan, you sort of map out? got a business plan. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, I look to... I look to get bigger, aren't I? I look to make a lot of money. Have a nice car, a big house and all that. And you can get it through doing this business. Nigel Marvin meets some enormous spiders in Giants next.